Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us on the next episode of the Intersectionality Project, where I am coming together as the cultural liaison and uh, interviewing some of the clinicians, some of the staff, some of the talent that we have here at MHC Healthcare on the things that they're doing well in meeting the uh, intersections of uh, personhood and environment. Um, and we're hoping to get a little bit of feedback on how gender gender interacts with sex and interacts with sexual orientation um, at the individual level and their uh, their health care. So welcome. Thank you. And I'll have you introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Brittany Brown. I'm a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. I've been here at MHC practicing since um, June of this yeah. past year, 2020. Prior to that, I spent my year in school doing um, my preceptorship here at MHC for school. Yeah. So I was already very much familiar with MHC before starting here as a new nurse practitioner. Um, I'm also in the process of completing um, my doctorate of nursing practice and my PhD yeah. in nursing from the College of Nursing at the U of A. Yes, um, and alma mater. Yes, yes. 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 And for um, my dissertation project, which I'm now in the process of proposing, I plan to look at um, the social transition process in transgender youth oh. and specifically examine the needs and experiences of those youth and their families so that way we can hopefully better meet those needs in the future mm. and kind of build research from there. Um, but broadly, I've been very much interested in LGBT mental health inequalities um, throughout my graduate education, my minor and for my PhDs in gender and women's studies. And so I've really, um, it's been something I've been very proud of and trying to cater to that population as a nurse practitioner, as a provider, and then as a nursing researcher so that their needs Oof. as a population can be better met. And hopefully those inequalities, not only in mental health, but in health can be better um, um, improved upon, better met. So, oh. yeah. But it's interesting because you say <clears throat> nursing, and now we in this field understand that a little bit more, but you're telling me that you're focused on, I hear nursing and then I hear mental health. So yeah. for those who are not very familiar with that, how do those two intersect? Yeah, so certainly I, um, prior to going back to graduate school to become a nurse practitioner, I was a nurse for, for six years. So really looking to me, you know, I'm very proud and love nursing as a whole, but I really think nursing encompasses this very holistic view of, of health oh, holistic. Um, and hu holistic in terms of per speaking of personhood. And mm -hmm. um, certainly I like to think the intersection of identities and, and how that impacts health. And so I think for me, um, being a nurse was very much something I couldn't separate from mm -hmm. um, wanting to meet the needs of, of my community because that's what a nurse does is meet the needs of their community and so for me I was always interested in mental health that's why I specialized in yeah. in psychiatric mental health as a, a nurse practitioner but um, I really think nursing um, has formed and shaped how I view health and certainly mental health and provide care now as a, as a clinician. Wow. You said the social transition process, yeah. and so again, um, for those uh, listening and tuning in, yeah. um, is there are there different? Yeah. Levels Certainly. of transition? Yeah. Certainly. Okay. So very transition cool. is, I mean, it's a very individual experience mm. um, and very unique to the to the individual. So for me and what I'm hoping to learn more about for my dissertation is the social transition process, which is different from the medical transition process. Yeah. So medical would be maybe if that individual chooses to have hormone therapy, oh, chooses yeah. to do any gender affirming surgical procedures sure. um, versus the social transition process mm -hmm. might be um, a change in pronouns that reflect the gender identity of that individual um, or clothing that matches their gender expression and identity or um, you know certainly this outward expression very socialized and so mm. for me why I am interested in that is the medical transition process in transgender youth is a little bit more researched and and known what that looks like versus mm -hmm. there's not as much known specifically about the social transition process oh, and again yeah transition is so individual and you could have two trans folks who have very different experiences and to yeah. their comfort or their I gender identity and expression and what they feel matches who they are and what those that they want to look like or again representing their identity and expression mm. and so because of that I think it's important to recognize that 
there are differences in how the social transition process might look versus the medical transition process, certainly. Yeah. <coughs> You've thrown. I know. I know, a lot. Know, you, a lot. So, it's very true. So you've thrown so much out yeah. there, and I, and I think in terms of how uh, somebody may have that experience. So how one, if I if I'm listening correctly, it's mm -hmm. how one identifies, and then how they want to express that. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah. I, what do you tend to? What What are you seeing in terms of those who are uh, identifying and, and going through that? social transition process in terms of what that might look like yeah. or what what yeah. kind of um uh disparities what kind of sure challenges? Is, certainly and so you know when we're looking at maybe trans youth and so those who are adolescents mm -hmm. there can be a lot of barriers in terms of okay now that maybe um this individual wants to present a different way how mm -hmm. is that going to impact their schooling um and the way they present at school what bathrooms are they going to use at school oh, that's yeah. um mm -hmm. what um you know, how are other kids going to interact with them? How are his family, what is their family support going to look like during oh, that process? Yeah. And all of those things ultimately will impact the whole transition process for them in terms of how they, um, to say maybe if, how positive or negative of an experience that process is, and then ultimately their outcomes, um, mental health and otherwise, based on that level of support or um, their experience as a whole, right? Yeah. So certainly, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because I'm very much aware that people uh, prefer stories versus statistics. Yeah. So we could come out here and we could provide yeah. uh, so many data points. Yeah. But I, I think in terms of what others might be tuning in for, um, what do you think is important for us to know about this population and how can we uh, be better at providing uh, support to our neighbors who yeah. might be uh, at this social transition process. Yeah, I think an openness and a willingness to engage in a dialogue and oh. understanding, and I think that can be hugely important, especially um, to allow for community building and feeling that support. Because, I mean, not to, again going back to the research, because yeah. as, yeah. as a researcher, yeah. that's where I tend to go, but. <laughs> yeah. The more support an individual mm -hmm. has during that process, the better the mm -hmm. outcomes at the end of the day. And family support ultimately might be the best, but social support and community mm -hmm. building is hugely important. Um, and especially finding a com their own community, certainly. But mm -hmm. I think allowing for conversation and dialogue, and um, if you have questions about, you know, hey, what's your experience? But of course, coming to them with these questions respectfully and in a way that's not intrusive, yeah, sure. um, especially as providers or anybody mm. who's interacting maybe in a medical setting, recognizing that like, hey, if I don't need to know certain things, maybe that aren't relevant to what we're doing today, maybe mm. we don't need to ask those, those questions, maybe keeping it relevant to that day. But also, if there are things that might be relevant to care for that individual, making sure yeah. you are addressing those things too and not thinking, oh, I don't need to ask them that. Or, and that's how these disparities occur, right, is not Ooh. addressing those certain things too. But I think community as a whole, really open dialogue with, with, with people in this community and the LGBT community and being willing to have and engage and learn and grow. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion about things like pronouns, yeah. a lot of discussion about how somebody might identify, identify versus how they might express themselves. Yes. Um, and I wonder how is that different from where somebody um, uh, uh, identifies romantically or with another sure, individual. Sure, and that is where there's a lot of conflation and confusion, I think. And mm. it's, uh, it, I think obviously there's LGBTQIA having them all, all those um, uh, identifiers grouped together, mm -hmm. it's a good thing, but it also can sometimes be difficult because mm -hmm. then some people think, okay, however you present, I can look at you and not only know your gender, but Ooh. maybe your sexual orientation. And confusing gender identity and sexual orientation is, it's a rocky road, it's not the right way to go. So okay. th the reason being, right, is because your sex, so the way you're born, okay. uh, is different from your gender, which is how you choose okay. to, to express yourself yes. um, and, and look and identify, and is different from your sexual orientation. I feel like I'm, hopefully I'm explaining this in a, in a way that makes sense, but certainly like just because somebody is trans doesn't mm -hmm. mean that 
that you're able to understand or know their sexual um, orientation because of their Ooh. their gender identity, right? Ooh. And so it's important to it's not confuse thing. the two. It's certainly, um, and so I think it's important to recognize that you can't make assumptions about anybody based on their appearances, and it's important to. Because of that, if in the need of, you know, in the medical setting needing to, to know, maybe understand for the point of um, meeting their needs, that's when those questions are relevant. But certainly out in the world, maybe it's not as relevant to, to need to know um, gender identity. You know, I guess if I'm tr explaining mm. myself well, I feel like I'm getting a little off track. But um, big important fact, don't confuse um, gender identity with sexual orientation, definitely. Oh. Yeah, important to recognize they're different. Um, Recognizing differences, I think that is something that I'm hearing <clears throat> you say, and I wonder how do you navigate that as a clinician yeah. and individuals are coming to you and you may not have all of that information yet, or maybe someone yeah. doesn't want to identify. Yeah, so I think, I mean, for me, I always like to start out like, hey, what I see your name here says that this is your name. Mm -hmm. Would you prefer that I call you that or do you have another name you go by? Then clarifying okay. pronouns and then from there asking about, you know, gender identity expression and then sexual orientation. And for me, mm. when I ever met with like, you know, I thought they're not sure, certainly that's okay. We can, they don't need to, there's no time frame in which somebody needs to decide who they are. Like that's okay. the beauty of life. You have lots of time to figure those, those things out, those things mm. out. But, um, I think, um, also making sure, recognizing to, when I'm explaining that to them, I'm asking these things so I, we can hopefully have conversations that ultimately help you and your mental mm. health, these things that are, these identifiers that are relevant to, to who you are and, and me meeting your needs better as, as a provider. Yeah. yeah. So asking mm -hmm. and feeling comfortable asking. Yes. And I have a sign in my office. It's a safe zone sign, yeah. um, which is a training I did as an undergrad student at the U of A. Yeah. Um, but I have a little sign and it says this space is welcoming to all identities regardless of, I think it says race, sexual orientation, gender, um, uh, and just letting people know that this is a safe space for those conversations when they see that sign in my office. So. So for community members who are yeah. really feeling connected with this, yeah. how might somebody find you? How might somebody uh, get connected with you? Well, I mean, I'm here located at MHC, the Wilmot office. So certainly okay. um, I think we have a great um, staff on site in terms of therapy services, recovery coaches for our patients with access, if that's what Oof. you mean specifically. Okay. And then me as a nurse practitioner specializing in psychiatric mm -hmm. mental health. So certainly reaching out to to meet with to meet with me for, for those mental health services. I think it's important to recognize too within MHC um, I know we have group support for LGBTQ um, patients as well, or just those who maybe are, like you said, still not sure and trying to figure out maybe how they fit in or where they fit in, in, in those identifiers. And like I mentioned, there's no need or rush to figure those things out in any sort of time frame. Um, and it's certainly a welcoming place here to take that time to explore those concepts and identities within themselves. Hmm. Yeah. It's beautiful. Stay tuned for the next episode in this project that we're doing and identifying all of the uh, wonderful uh, affirming services that we have here at yeah. MHC Healthcare. And thank you for sharing for uh, what it is that you do yeah. with us.